Today I'm going to explain to you the essential concept of hyperparameter tuning as quickly as possible. So let us get right into it. Alright, so let us get started right away. One thing we need to understand before we can understand hyperparameter tuning is the idea of splitting data into a training and testing set and also splitting into validation sets and maybe also cross validation. So these are uh, concepts that we're going to cover quite quickly here. Imagine you have some supervised machine learning task and you have a data set that you want to use for that. So supervised learning for those of you who don't know it means the data is labeled, we have ground truth, we know the correct answers. We know in the case of a regression task, what the correct value is that we're trying to predict. We know in the case of a classification task, what the correct classes that we're looking for, and our data contains the answers. So what we usually do when we train a model is we use around 80% of the data for training. So that would be the training set. And we use the remaining 20% or whatever remains here for testing for evaluation. The idea here being if I have a model, I train it on the data here and it performs, let's say decent, it has 97% accuracy on the training data, it could happen that it only has 20% accuracy on the testing data. So we reserve a portion of the data that the model never sees, just to see if the model can perform decent um, on this unseen data. Now what we sometimes also do is we reserve an additional portion of the training data. So for example, here, 20% of the 80% for validation. Validation is basically the same as testing, but it has a different uh, purpose. The validation set is for tuning the model for tuning certain things about the model for tuning the so called hyperparameters. Now what are hyperparameters, for example, in a neural network, if I have some input neurons here, and then I have maybe uh, a hidden layer, then maybe I have another hidden layer and another hidden layer, and then some output neuron here. Imagine all of these being interconnected here, I'm not going to draw it now. But essentially, how many hidden layers I have, how many neurons per hidden layer I have, what activation function I choose, um, what optimizer I choose, and all of that stuff, this is a hyperparameter. These are hyperparameters. These are things that I can change that influence the model's uh, performance. In the case of k nearest neighbors classification, where we have multiple data points that are already labeled, and then I have some new unlabeled point, um, I have also hyperparameters like how many neighbors do I look for if k is equal to three, that is a hyperparameter if I set it to five, for example, now, in this case, maybe it's not true. But if I set it to five, I might get a different classification, then I can also decide do I want to have a weighted distance or do I want to have a weight based on the distance, that would be a yes, no, a true false a Boolean hyperparameter. In the case of a random forest classifier, we have multiple decision trees that work in an ensemble. And these decision trees can have certain attributes. For example, first of all, how many decision trees do I want to use in my random forest. And then also stuff like how deep can an individual tree be? What is the maximum depth per tree? What is the min sample split? So how many samples do I need per node to allow to split them into sub notes into child notes, all these decisions that I make can influence how well my model performs. And before launching a model into production, it might make sense to actually go ahead and try different configurations to see what works best. Now, the cool thing is we don't necessarily need a validation set for this, we can use something called cross validation. So CV cross validation, the basic idea being if I have my training data here, I can split it into folds, and I can use these for training, and this one for evaluation, then I can use these for training, and this one for evaluation, I can basically uh, use everything except for one fold for training, and then just use this one fold for testing for validation. And then I don't need to throw away 20% of my data when it comes to training the model. So I can use all of the training data for training the model, but I can still do validation. Now that we understand the theory, let us put all of this into practice, we have a very basic setup here, we just load the breast cancer data set into Python, we do an 80 20 train test split, and then we scale our x data because one of the two models, the k neighbors classifier, is scale sensitive because it relies on a distance measure. So we need to scale the data. And now what I can do without any hyperparameter tuning is I can just say KNN is equal to K neighbors classifier with default settings. And then I can say KNN dot fit, I can pass here my training 
uh, data, which is scaled, and my ground truth, the Y train data, this trains the K neighbors classifier instantaneously, because in this case, we just use the data as training, the data itself is the model. Uh, and then I can evaluate it, I can say KNN.score to evaluate for accuracy, and I can pass the test data, which is scaled, and the ground truth for the test data. Now we get a certain score. In this case, I get 95.61% uh, accuracy. But what happens, for example, if I say that I want to have a different uh, number of neighbors, I look at so we can look into the documentation, the default number here is five, which means that our model uses the five closest neighbors to determine the class. So what happens if I say this is equal to one only consider the closest neighbor that you have, if I do that, in this case, nothing changes. In this case, it's the same result. What if I change this to nine? In this case, also the same result. So it seems like for this particular data set, it doesn't really have a huge effect to modify this. Now, maybe we can go extreme and try 23. Oh, this changes now the score. So in this case, that is worse uh, for this particular train test split. But what I'm doing right now is not a good practice. I'm trying to figure out the best parameter using the testing data. So I have nothing to evaluate this on that I have not used before. So this is not how you tune hyperparameters. But in general, this is the idea you have different parameters that you can set, I can, for example, also decide that I want to use a distance based weighting for, um, for the neighbors. So I can say here weights is equal to distance. Now, this has a positive effect in this case. So you can see the idea and you can see that it can be quite tedious to do this manually. And also you don't want to do this on the testing data. And also I don't necessarily want to reserve 20% of the training data for validation. So I can do something very simple in scikit-learn, I can remove these cells and I can say from scikit-learn dot model selection import, and then I can import something called grid search cross validation, and also randomized search cross validation, I'm going to talk about the difference here in a second. But in the case of our K neighbors classifier, what I would do now is I would define a so called parameter grid. So I would say param grid is equal to a dictionary, where the keys are the names of the hyperparameters, for example, n underscore neighbors. And then on the right side, I would pass a list of values that I want to try. For example, I could try one, I could try the default five, I could try nine, and then I could try 23, which I just did. Then in addition to that, I also want to see if it's better to use weighting or not distance based weighting or not. So I can say, wait, I think the parameter was weight, no, it was weights. And then I can pass a list here with the words uniform. So no distance based weighting or distance. Now what happens with this parameter grid is I want to evaluate these four, but I also want to evaluate these two, which means if I want to evaluate all combinations, I would have to do four times two evaluations or four times two runs. Now, there's another thing, I can now create a grid search instance and say this is a grid search of a model, which I still need to instantiate. So I can say K and N is equal to K neighbors classifier. Uh, but I still have to pass here um, certain parameters when it comes to cross validation. So if you look into the documentation of grid search CV, you can see the first thing that we pass is the estimator. So our K and N instance, then the second thing is the parameter grid, but then we also have the parameters CV which is for cross validation. And if we scroll down and look at CV, you can see that this gives us the number of folds for the cross validation split, which means that if I have three folds, I'm gonna have to do three runs because I have to train on two, evaluate on the third one, then I have to train on other two. So basically, I have three combinations in which I can choose two, and then evaluate on the third one, which means I have three runs. So in total, with this parameter grid, I would have uh, four times two times three. So that would be 24 runs that I would have to train the model evaluate the model. So now I would say here parameter grid, and I would say that CV is equal to three. And what would happen now if I say grid search dot fit on x train scaled and on y train, that basically now runs a grid search in this case now gives me the best estimator. How do I see that I go to grid search and then I say best estimator underscore, this will give me the K neighbors classifier with the best configuration. In this case, it's nine neighbors and uniform weights, I could also try to do grid search dot best params. So this would give me the parameters weights uniform and neighbors nine, that is the best combination 
with this specific training data and these parameters. Now I can also introduce something else. For example, I can say 11. Now keep in mind, every time I increase the number of things I have here, I increase the multiplication. So I have four times two times uh, three. Now I have five times two times three, which is 30. So I have to consider all of this. Uh, so I can run this. And now I would get nine still. So even though I have 11 in the list, nine seems to be better. So that is the optimal choice, given this particular set of training data. Now, there is also the randomized search CV. This is useful if you have uh, a large parameter space or if you have continuous space. So for example, you could have some hyper parameter here, I'm going to just call this hyper that um, could be something like 0.2. It could also be something like 0.675. It could also be something like 888. So 0.888. Uh, that is a continuous space. And in this case, randomized search CV might make more sense. It also makes more sense if you have a huge range. So for example, zero to 2000, everything in between. So let's get rid of all this. And let's do a randomized search for the random forest, I'm going to delete these cells here. And the idea here is, as I said, we're working with distribution. So I'm going to import something from SciPy. Uh, I'm going to import actually from SciPy dot stat stats, I'm going to import rand int for random integer. And now we're not going to specify a parameter grid, we're going to specify a parameter distribution. So we do the same thing as before we define the hyperparameter that we want to tune, but instead of providing a list of values to choose from, we provide a range to sample from. So for example, I could say, uh, if I want to have the min samples split for a random forest, I could say I want this to be a random integer starting from two up until 11 for the number of estimators and estimators, I could say that I want this to go from, let's say, rent in five to 500, for example. And then I could say that I also want to have a max depth. So I'm going to say max depth. And this could be anything from two to 50. Now we can do the exact same thing as before I can say randomized search and I can say that this is randomized search CV, I pass again, the instance, so I have to define a random forest classifier, just like before with default settings, and then I can say pass this and then as a parameter distributions dictionary, I'm going to pass param dist, and I can still pass CV equals three. Now, what's important is, since I'm going to do random sampling, I don't have predefined here how many values I'm going to combine and check. So I need to manually specify that I want to have, for example, 40 iterations. This means I'm going to have 40 times sampling. Um, and this is what I'm going to to base this on this is going to be the random iterations that I do. So I can hard code the number, I don't have to do the calculation like four times two times three or something like that. I can just do it like this. And when I run this, I can do randomized search dot fit, and I can fit on the training data, train scaled, and then train. Okay, this takes quite some time. So let me go with 10 iterations to speed this up for the video. And as a result, I get again, a best estimator so I can look at it and see that the parameters are the following 144 trees in the forest and a maximum depth of 18. The rest is default, you can see everything that's black is default, everything that's orange is a deviation from the default. That is the best estimator. And of course, I can store that I can say this is now my classifier. And then I can say classifier score and evaluate if it really performs well on the testing data that is on scene, like this. And this is how you do hyperparameter tuning in Python, at least in scikit-learn, you can also do similar stuff for PyTorch for TensorFlow with number of neurons with activation functions. Of course, you can also do this manually. But this is super important, because there are certain settings that you can tweak. If you tweak these settings, you're going to get better performance. And you want to do that with a validation set or with cross validation. And then finally, you want to evaluate uh, in the final round before deploying on unseen data, the testing data. This is how you do hyperparameter tuning. So that's it for today's video. I hope you enjoyed it. And I hope you learned something. If so, let me know by hitting a like button and leaving a comment in the comment section down below. And of course, don't forget to subscribe to this channel and hit the notification bell to not miss a single future video for free. Other than that, thank you much for watching. See you in the next video. And bye.